Hello, I'm continuing with my series on beliefs, the series on beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and today I'm going to be looking at belief number 15. So belief number 15 is baptism, and it says, by baptism we confess our faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and testify of our death to sin and of our purpose to walk in newness of life. Thus we acknowledge Christ as Lord and Savior, become his people, and are received as members by his church. Baptism is a symbol of our union with Christ, the forgiveness of our sins, and our reception of the Holy Spirit. It is by immersion, very important, it is by immersion in water and is contingent on the affirmation of faith in Jesus and evidence of repentance of sins. Repentance of sin. It follows instruction in the Holy Scriptures and acceptance of their teaching. Okay, so we saw a very important word there, immersion. So let me show you an illustration here. So this is Jolly Bee. Some of you know Jolly Bee quite well. Now, let's say Jolly Bee wants to get baptized. Let's say Jolly Bee has uh, read the Bible and he loves Jesus and he wants to get baptized. If Jolly Bee gets a little bit of sprinkling on the head like that like a lot of people do a little bit of sprinkling it's convenient you know you don't have to go all the way under not, not too much trouble convenient is that the baptism that the Bible is speaking about no and, and Jolly B knows it's not either you see the baptism of the Bible as we saw in the the reading of the fundamental belief is by immersion and so when Jolly Bee goes under the water, what happens? He stops breathing. And that reminds us of death. When you die, when you go into the grave, when your life ceases, the breath stops. So there's a symbol of, of death in baptism. And then when he comes up, he breathes the first new breath of his new life in Christ. So we want to practice baptism the way the Bible says to practice it, if we want to follow the Bible, which is what we should want. Okay, let's continue talking about this. So that is fundamental belief number 15. Oh yes, by the way, before I go into that, just once again, a reminder, a reminder. Go on do Google, quick search on Google will allow us to know that you can, you can get this PDF, 28 Beliefs of the Adventist Church. 15th edition. This is the latest edition. As I said, you do a Google search, you can get them all. And those readings I've been doing, you get them all. And like I said, today I am on belief number 15. In the book of Romans, this is the New King James, Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? 
Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ, just as Christ, see, we want to follow Christ. Christ was baptized by immersion. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. So, as we saw, Jolly B came up, stopped breathing when he went down, came up, took that new breath of the new life in Christ. That's That's really what we're reminded of. Even so, we should walk in newness of life. The old life, the old ways, the old characters is washed away. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And this is from Bible Hub, the Greek word for baptism, baptisma, Strong's Concordance, the result of di dipping or sinking. Does it say sprinkling? No, dipping or sinking. Indicates submerging, dipping, immersion. So the word is telling us let us continue here, baptisma in the Greek. Immersion, submersion. Again, Bible Hub, free tool, very useful for looking up the original languages of the passages. In this case, it would be the New Testament Greek. Washing and cleansing from Old Testament to New. What do we see? Well, ceremonial washings of the priests in the Old Testament. So this idea of washing and cleansing, we see... Throughout Scripture, cleanliness is related to godliness. Throughout Scripture, cleanliness is related to righteousness. In the Old Testament, we see ceremonial washing of the priest, the consecration of the priest. Leviticus 8.6, 8, Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. He washed them with what? with water. So when the priests were being consecrated, Moses washed them with water. We see uh, Hebrews 9.10 refers to the various washings of the Old Testament uh, system, the Old Testament ceremonial system. Uh, cleansing of the sanctuary. So this concept of cleansing, well, we, we see the cleansing of the sanctuary and Yom Kippur, that symbolic cleansing, just to again get to that idea of the importance of this uh, understanding of cleansing and how it relates to baptism. So we're going from these themes of the Old Testament and the, the context of the Old Testament to the New, uh, ceremonial ceremonial cleansing as as I've spoken about we see in, in Leviticus 15 from unclean emissions from the body for example you know the book of Leviticus is all about cleansing that's that's a key word for the book of Leviticus cleansing Job 417 can a mortal be righteous more righteous than God can a man be more pure than his maker. So righteousness, uh, a parallel in this passage for the word righteousness is pure, pure, purity. And so cleansing is a way to make pure. We are a nation, the Bible reveals in the book of Revelation 5.10. We are a nation of kings and priests and also in Revelation 1, 5 and 6. What do we read there? And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of earth, to him who loved us and washed us, washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus. So as we consider uh, the cleansing of the sanctuary in Leviticus 16, it was the blood of the goat 
It was the blood of the goat that was used to symbolically cleanse the sanctuary. But that blood represents the blood of Christ as we can recognize. For example, if we look at the book of Hebrews, for example, uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4 and also Hebrews 10 and 11 reveals that the blood of those animals could not take away sins. Those animals couldn't take away sin. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. But pointed to the blood of Christ. So it, it was a symbolic way of representing the blood of Christ that cleansed the sanctuary. And it is his blood that cleanses us. And yet, there is the physical act of baptism that the Bible speaks of in the New Testament. Well, in Isaiah 118, we see the cleansing once again. That, that language of cleansing, that language of being cleansed, the context of this passage reveals it. Or, or the, uh, the, um, the meaning, the meaning of this passage. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So, how does that happen? Well, the blood of Christ, the sacrifice of Jesus. That's how it happens. So again, when we look at that passage in Romans chapter 6, when we look at Romans 6, 1 through 6, we are reminded of what? Let's go back there to Romans. It says, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism. So that, that act of baptism, just as I showed Jolly be getting baptized, reminds us that we have died in Christ. And so the act of baptism, it is a physical act. It is a real physical act. They were baptized as we'll continue to see, but they were also, they were also understanding that they were washed, cleansed. They were cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Let's continue. So this is from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 5, page 297. Baptizo, to dip, to immerse. Baptizo was used of immersing cloth and in dye. So that word was used to speak of uh, immersing cloth in dye and of submerging a vessel in order to fill it with water. The meaning of the word itself, together with specific details of the narrative in the Gospels, makes it clear that John's baptism was administered by immersion. Let's look at uh, the context of chapter 8 of the book of Acts. The Ethiopian eunuch is noted that both the one baptizing and the one baptized went down into the water and came up out of the water. Okay, you could look in Acts chapter 8, 38 and 39. Had pouring or sprinkling been permissible, you know, as, as is commonly practiced in many churches today, if that were permissible, the eunuch, instead of waiting until they came unto certain water before requesting baptism, might have offered Philip uh, water from his flask. He could have said, baptize me right now, just sprinkle me in water. But clearly, the New Testament, after the resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, they were pa ba practicing baptism by immersion, just the way Jesus was baptized. Ancient sources, you know, they could have said, oh, you know, God understands the motive. This is more convenient. You know, let's update it a bit. Let's update it a bit and change it around to make it convenient. No, they were sticking by the word of God. Ancient sources reveal that John the Baptist was not the first to introduce baptism. The Jews early followed the practice of baptizing proselytes into Judaism. 
Uh, Jewish proselyte baptism is probably older than Christian baptism. It marked the experience of conversion from paganism to Judaism. This is Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 9, and page 95. So when some uh, pag someone from a pagan background, a Gentile, wanted to become Jewish, they were baptized. So it wasn't, John, according to the, the, uh, this source, it wasn't John the Baptist who invented this practice. But as we saw, this ceremonial washings, the baptizing of proselytes was something that was going on long before John the Baptist started to baptize people uh, for the repentance of sins. In other words, washing away the sins, washing away the life, the old life of sin. Do motives matter in baptism? The Bible says in Mark 16, 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So if someone gets baptized but they don't believe, what about a child, an infant child? Can a child make that decision? No, a child doesn't know what he's accepting. You know, the practice of somebody speaking on behalf of a child in, in order to, to speak on behalf of someone else, this is not something the Bible speaks about. It's not something the Bible speaks about. Each person has to make that, that decision on their own. So when a child is, is first born and doesn't understand, that child cannot make the decision to get baptized. Does that mean that if the child dies, that child is going to be lost? That is not our place. To decide that God weighs the motives of the heart. The child has not yet reached the age of accountability. The child has not re reached the age of accountability. And it is God who weighs the motives of the heart. So we cannot assume that because a, a little child died uh, and, and wasn't able to get baptized, that that means that that child is lost. That is that is not for us to say that the, the covering, the grace of Christ, really G Jesus died for all of humanity and his, his grace is a blanket offering for all of humanity. And, and Jesus loves the little children and they have a, a, they have angels, the Bible says, that behold the Father's face. So we can't say, well, we got to baptize them in order for them. Our works aren't going to save that child, and that child hasn't made the decision. So that practice is of baptizing a child who doesn't know what he believes. That is not a biblical practice. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, what about the thief on the cross in the book of Luke? Uh, he couldn't get baptized. So again, God weighs the motives of the heart. And this is what Proverbs 16, 2 reveals to us and Proverbs 21, 2. So the thief on the cross, he couldn't actually physically get baptized. But Jesus said, you're going to be with me in paradise. You're going to be with me in paradise. And by the way, that doesn't mean he'd be with him in paradise that very day, because obviously Jesus didn't go to, to, Jesus didn't ascend yet. Jesus didn't ascend yet to the Father that very day. Uh, he went into the grave, and then throughout Saturday he was in the grave and arose early Sunday. So he was crucified on Good Friday. So we, we can't say, well, that means that um, as soon as uh, as the as the thief on the cross died, he would have actually been there with Jesus in paradise because obviously Jesus didn't ascend until the third day anyway. But let's continue. Acts 19, 1 through 6. Paul at Ephesus. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. Into John's baptism. But remember, when we go to the book of, for example, in the book of Matthew, 
Matthew chapter 28, 19. And Jesus came and spoke to them. This is after the resurrection of Jesus, saying, All authority has been given. Oh, I'm in verse 18, Matthew uh, 28, 18. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then in verse 19, this is Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus Jesus says to the disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So this is different than John's baptism. So we again, if we look at this progression, we see ceremonial washings in the Old Testament. We see the baptizing of proselytes into Judaism. We see John's baptism of repentance. And then we see Jesus' baptism. Jesus' baptism, where he says, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28 and verse number 19. So, Paul says, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, indeed, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. So to baptize into repentance is, is to say, I'm going to turn away from my sins. I acknowledge and I'm going to turn away from my sins. First uh, John 1, 8 and 9 you got to be honest with God, as I spoke yesterday. You confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive them. And so this was a baptism of repentance. This was John's baptism. But when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on him, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. The Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So when Jesus speaks of baptism, there is an alteration, so to speak, from the baptism of what John was doing, but not in terms of the physical practice of going under the water. And as I mentioned, it was the same thing for the Jewish proselytes, but the meaning, the meaning was deepened uh, to its ultimate to its ultimate conclusion that it is into Christ, into the baptism of Christ. We are being baptized into his death and raised up in newness of life and being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the book of John, chapter 3, Nicodemus said to Jesus, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, of water and the Spirit. So we, when we understand that um, Jesus was baptized and we want to follow in his footsteps and we want to receive that newness of life, then we then follow and we get baptized. It should be our motive to do so. Now, in the case of an extreme situation like the thief on the cross or a child who has not reached the age of accountability, who doesn't understand God's grace and mercy is extended because God is graceful. But if you have the ability, you can get baptized. You understand the message. It is your duty to get baptized. Matthew 3.16, Matthew 3.16, when he had been baptized, this is Jesus, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. So here we see that Jesus himself was baptized. Well, this is just a little bit on... Fundamental belief number 15, and this is something we want to practice as followers of Christ. I hope it was a blessing to you.